Great. So, uh, warm welcome. Good morning to all of you. My name is Robert Dijkgraaf. I'm the director, actually, here at the Institute for Advanced Study. It's a great pleasure to welcome you at the place where Albert Einstein worked for more than 22 years. And so, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to tell you a little bit more about his work and, you know, how it's still, every day, very, very exciting. So, my lecture will be roughly an hour. Then we have some opportunity for questions and answers. And, uh, and then that's it for this morning. Also want to point out that Labyrinth Books is outside and they're selling books for children about physics, about Einstein, and it's wonderful to have that collaboration. But actually, I think before I give my lecture, I actually want to invite a special guest this morning. So I hope you give a warm hand to Albert Einstein. When Albert Einstein was five years old, his father gave him a compass. And like everybody, he was surprised that the needle was always pointing north. But he also discovered if you walk through the house, there was something pushing the needle everywhere. There was a field, and now we call it the magnetic field. And Einstein said that that moment, when he was five years old, opened his eyes. There were things around us that we cannot see, but we can measure. I want to give you an applause for this very young Albert Einstein. Thank you. <laughs> Oops. Yes, you can go down. <laughs> yeah, we can go down. Brilliant. Uh, so Einstein discovered, in some sense, when he was five years old, uh, the magnetic field. And you will understand at the end of the lecture, this was, in some sense, very symbolic. Because if one thing Einstein did is change our idea of space and time, there are lots of stuff happening just in the space and time that we're all living into. Now, Einstein actually, as a young boy, he was quite brilliant, but he also, he wasn't a good student in the sense that his teachers liked him. He uh, was pretty arrogant. Uh, he had good grades actually for science and for mathematics, but not such good grades for German and history. And when his parents moved to, uh, to Italy, he actually decided that the last two years in high school he would uh, do himself in Switzerland. He went to the university, and also in the university he didn't get good grades. Actually, he didn't go to any of the lectures. Uh, and it's quite special, he was the last in his class. And all the students got nice jobs, Albert Einstein did not he had to work in the so-called patent office. And uh, he was a patent clerk, third class. Uh, but he had lots of time. He was kind of doing boring work, but he was thinking about many ideas. And in 1905, he was 26, he had five amazing breakthroughs. Each of them, he could earn a Nobel Prize. He only got one Nobel Prize. But one thing he did, he perhaps he wrote down the most famous equation. Can anybody tell me what is the most famous equation Albert Einstein wrote down? I want to hear it. E yeah, E equals mc squared. Uh, now I'm not going to explain this equation, but the important thing is, you might not know, the most important part of the equation is the equal sign in the middle. Because it tells that energy and mass are essentially the same thing. C squared, C is the speed of light. It, you just have to know it's a very big number, it's a 300 million. So 300 million squared is a huge number. And this tells you two things. It tells you that you need a lot of energy to produce a little bit of mass. For instance, in these modern particle accelerators, they're many miles big. You use all these machines to produce one small particle. But in the, you can also do it the other way around. 
if you have a little bit mass, like for instance this uh, blackberry, so what, suppose I turn this blackberry into pure energy, how big of an explosion would that be? Using E equals mc squared, what do you think? Oh, let me show you. Actually an atom bomb would be the strength of the energy sitting in a single blackberry. So that actually tells you that, you know, you can a lot of energy out of mass. So that was one of his big discoveries. We had another discovery, and this is perhaps the most difficult part of the lecture, I still want to tell you, because Albert Einstein was do, able to do something that I think none of us can do. He could think in four dimensions. So now we all know there are three dimensions here, right? Length and breadth and height. So, but how can you think about the fourth dimension? So I have a few animations, so look at them. So this is a square in two dimensions. So that's easy. You know, if, you, if you're like an ant and you live in a, just you know, on, on a plane, that's the only thing you could, could kind of draw. It, uh, you only have length and breadth. This is a, a square or a cube in three dimensions. I hope you enjoy my animation. I made it myself. <laughs> so it looks really three-dimensional, right? But of course it's not. It's on the screen. But suppose I would have brought a real cube here, a three-dimensional cube. Do you realize what you're watching right now is not me or the screen? You're looking at the back of your eyes. The back of your eyes is a little screen, and that's what your brain is looking at. And that retina, the backside of your eye, is just purely two-dimensional. So the third dimension, you don't really see it. You make it in your mind. So why not see a fourth dimension? Now mathematicians, very clever mathematicians can do this. And if you want to draw a cube in four dimensions, this is how it looks like. Whoa. So this is the shadow of a four-dimensional object. So the thing is, if you, would be, if you have four-dimensional eyes, you could see things like this. Now, in some sense, this is not exactly what Einstein did. He did something else. I want to explain that to you, too. So, for instance, we want to think about time. So, you see here, this is a movie. It has two particles. They're orbiting around. Um, so, you think you're looking at a movie, but you're not. What you're looking at is a sequence of images. Now, even if you go to the movie theater, you see a lot of pictures very fast, one after the other. Now, suppose we take these pictures and stack them up, as I've done here on the left-hand side. So this is the earliest moment, this is a slightly less, later, etc., etc. So now you have an extra dimension, which is time, it's running upwards. So Einstein said that's how we should think about physics. We should have space and time together, and we should have like one big block of space and time. And that was his kind of brilliant mathematical insight. Now, I, you shouldn't understand this right now, because otherwise you're all little Einsteins. But this, is, this was an enormous breakthrough uh, to understand physics in this way. So Einstein actually, uh, when he had these discoveries, I must say the older physicists, they not all of them immediately understood what he was doing. Some said, wait a moment, Albert, you are starting where I want to end up. He took like, he had really brilliant ideas. But then he was discovered by his fellow physicists and he was invited to become a professor in Berlin, which was like the center of physics in that time, in 1912. And there he had a moment. He started to think about something very, very simple. He started to think about gravity. Now, we all know gravity. If I take this apple, you know, that's famous. Newton uh, described this, this apple will fall down. So there's something pulling the apple down. But what is actually pulling down? Even Newton himself said, well, I can describe it. I don't really know what's happening. So Einstein had one moment, and he describes this. He's, he's sitting in his office, and he's looking at people who are repairing the roof on the other building. And he wondered, well, what would happen if they would fall down? And then he said, I had my happiest thought ever. <laughs> he realized that if you fall down, you don't feel gravity. If, you would be, if you're now sitting in your chair, you feel the gravity pulling you in. But if you would be floating, 
in space, you don't feel gravity. And perhaps you have seen these images of astronauts in the space station or something. Here's, for instance, this actually is Charles Simoni. The funny thing is he's the chairman of our board of trustees. He went into space twice. You see here is drinking some water. If you've, we now have seen all these images. It's not surprising. Now, it's very difficult, for instance, to brush your hair or something. And perhaps you've seen it yesterday. There were two astronauts, two female astronauts, that went on the spacewalk. It was a great moment, actually. So we all know this. But the thing is, can we here do a spacewalk here and, you know, have no gravity for a brief moment. And I think we can. And I, I have a volunteer here. Pietro, you want to come? So, an applause for Pietro. So, I want you to float this apple above your hand, like this. You think you can do this? Yeah. Okay, let's give it a try. So, we, 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 we practice. Yeah, so, first stand, so Pietro is going to stand on the stairs. So he's a little bit like the, the people who are repairing the roof, but you know, it's not a very high roof, so it's fine. <laughs> so hold the apple above your hand, or your hand so. So I want it to float here. And what he's going to do, he's going to jump off the stairs and at the same time, let this apple go. And the question is, what, you should look very careful what happens. Does it fall to the other hand or does it kind of stay at the same distance? Try. Let's do it again. <laughs> you did it very well. You see, the moment you were jumping off, actually, no, both your hand and the apple, they both fall. So in some sense, the apple is hovering above the hand. Do it once more. Excellent. Thank you. An applause. <laughs> so we can float an apple. But if that's the idea, how would you, for instance, uh, explain how the moon is orbiting the Earth. If it's just falling, why does, does it go around in a circle? And Einstein was thinking for, about this for many, many, many years. And then he realized that space, and we think of space, suppose it's, this is a piece of space. Einstein realized that space actually should have very funny properties, should be able to stretch it, to curve it, like it's a big piece of material. And in that way, you can explain why gravity, for instance, makes the moon go around the Earth. Now, some of you might have wondered, why is the trampoline here? But the trampoline is here to demonstrate. So I need two volunteers, but I think I want two girls this time, because we had two, uh, you and you. Yeah, the two of you. OK, so one of you has to be the Earth. And you have to be strong. So who? Can you be the, the Earth? Sure. OK, so, so here I have a piece of space. It's intergalactic space, real intergalactic space. <laughs> and this heavy ball is the Earth. So can you put it down in the middle? Well, not everybody can see it, but you know, I have a little animation here. So this was happening. So actually, you see it starting to curve, right? Yeah. OK, now you have to be the moon. And the moon is much lighter, so you can take the yellow ball. And now the question is, can you throw it so that it kind of tries to go around in a circle? Like roll it? Yeah, very quietly. Yeah, pretty good. If you can see it, can you do it once more? So like this. See, that's, it's, not everybody can see it, but you can see it here on the screen. It's rolling around. So this was his big insight. If space can be curved, then just falling can actually be an interesting motion, like going, a moon going around. Thank you very much for doing this. An applause for this. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. So, and one way to understand that, if you have uh, some space and you've put something in space, then the mass that you put in space will tell how space should be curved. And if space is curved, then space will tell all of us, whether we're falling or it's a particle or, or a person, how to go around. So in that sense, Einstein explained for the first time why and how gravity works, which is pretty interesting because as long as there have been humans, there must have been feeling gravity and wondering about it. And he also realized there's a way to prove this because if everything has to go through the curved space, then light also has to go through the curved space. 
light has to travel through space exactly as the little ball here through the trampoline. So he realized that if you look at stars very close to the sun, as here indicated in the diagram, that the light rays will be a little bit pulled apart and the position of the stars will be different. Now he wanted to know, can we do this experiment? How can you look at stars very close to the sun? When can you do this? If somebody has an idea how to do this. Because if I look at the sun, I don't see any stars, right? Is there any moment when you can look at the sun and still see stars? Yes. At an eclipse, exactly. But you had to wait for the right moment. So it turned out that in May, May 29th, 1919, exactly 100 years ago, there was a solar eclipse. So, and teams from all countries went to various places to look at the solar eclipse and take a picture of the sun at the very moment that the moon was across the sun. Then you can look at the stars. Actually, if some of you lived through, we had an eclipse here, uh, or partial, partial eclipse, perhaps some of you went to see the real eclipse. Indeed, day turns into night, and you can see the stars. So this is the famous picture. I mean, I haven't here, but it's in our archives. We actually have this picture that was sent to Albert Einstein that showed that the positions of the stars were at different ways. So this actually was a terrific discovery. At that moment, everybody know Einstein theory is real. It's actually describing the universe. And he instantaneously, he became world famous. This was the headline in the New York Times, light all askew in the heavens. Also, they said, a book for 12 wise men, which is like silly. I think all physicists immediately understood what was going on. And he had produced his theory already four years earlier. And actually, women also understood that theory. <laughs> uh, but Einstein became famous. He became a star. He traveled around the world. And of course, he also traveled to the United States. He was a fun guy. He really liked to have fun with people. Uh, and, uh, but then Einstein was able to do something which is really spectacular. For the first time in the history of science, somebody could do a calculation, not of a particle or a machine, but a calculation of the complete universe. So at first, I think we should have a sense where we are. And this is a short movie uh, that actually starts not in Princeton, uh, it actually starts in Venice, Italy, but uh, just, I would say, relax, and I'll take you through a three-minute tour of the universe. Here we go. So we zoom out. Okay, we see the planet Earth. There's the moon. Now you see the other planets. Oops, goes fast, the sun in the middle. And there we'll have the first stars. So here we're moving through the Milky Way. Now, each of these dots is the real position of a star measured. These are not snowflakes. These are all stars, like our sun. We're moving very fast. It will take even light many years to go from one star to the other. So we, we travel here at a million times the speed of light. We go through these beautiful clouds, these nebula. You know this one. Perhaps somebody knows, recognized, ooh, went very fast. It was the horse head nebula. Perhaps you have a poster at home. These nebulas are like nursery schools for stars. So here the young stars are born. You know, here we see a very beautiful one. Uh, this is the Rosetta Nebula. You see many, many stars there. And there are also other clouds. You see the one there on the left? It's the Crab Nebula. You shouldn't go there. That's actually not a place where stars are born. Here's a place where a star died, a supernova explosion. It happened in the year 1054. But you should know this cloud, this Crab Nebula, is six and a half thousand light years away. So the explosion actually happened six and a half thousand years 
earlier and then it came to us. And here we see our, our Milky Way, it's coming. You see how many stars? There are a hundred billion stars in our Milky Way. But here we go, the starship goes, and you see what's happening now. You see all these other little dots here? These are not stars. These are all galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars. In fact, now we are a million light years away, and here are our companions. There are two galaxies very close by, the uh, uh, Triangulum Galaxy and uh, the Andromeda Nebula. Uh, at some point they will merge, but you know, there are many, many more. In fact, our sun is not that special. No, it's a little bit like the outside of the Milky Way, and our Milky Way is not that special. It's kind of an average, smallish galaxy. There are many more. And you see, in some sense, it's more like living in Princeton instead of New York City. Uh, in fact, if you look in our neighborhood of the universe, and you see all these galaxies that all are full of, full of stars, here the camera slowly moves to what would be the metropolis, the center of our neighborhood of the universe. And slowly the camera, you already see it coming, it's there, in the top left. It's zooming in, in a gigantic galaxy that is really 100 times more massive, many more stars than, uh, than our Milky Way. You see the camera is zooming in, zooming in. And so now we're really going to the big city. Uh, this big elliptic galaxy, this big cloud, see you coming there? Coming, 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 coming. And, you know, it's a little bit like a mystery movie because it will stop just before we hit the center of this galaxy. And I will come back to this. So, these are all these beautiful stars. And, you know, I'm, we often say billion, you know? What is a billion? And I think, you know, all of us should have an idea what a billion is. So, I brought a billion with me. Uh, not a billion dollars, unfortunately, <laughs> but a billion grains of sand. So, if you have a bucket of fine sand like this, that's roughly a billion. This will be roughly a million in my hand. So, if you think about that, our Milky Way is, has a hundred buckets of sand. And then there are a hundred buckets of sand where each grain of sand is a galaxy. So these are really big numbers. So how exciting that Einstein actually could start to calculate something. So he put the universe in his equations and he made a tremendous discovery, perhaps the biggest discovery ever in the history of physics. He discovered that the universe was doing something unexpected. Does somebody have an idea what the universe is doing? Yes. It's expanding, exactly. He noticed that if you use his equations, the universe expands. And then he immediately realized, well, if in the future it will be expanding, then in the past it was much smaller. So there should be a beginning of the universe. There should be a big bang. And he was so frightened by this result. This was like such a crazy result that there should be a moment where the whole universe was like in a point that he did something very, very bad. He changed the equations. He said, let's, okay, this, this can't be true. My theory should be wrong. And afterwards he said, this was his biggest blunder. He should not have changed the equations. He should have believed the equations. Now, an expanding universe I feel is very difficult. I always get questions about this, you know, what do you mean, are we all b growing a little bit bigger? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, the expansion goes very slow. It goes like per year, one part in a billion. So it's very, very slow. But actually, I brought a little toy universe here. So this is the universe. Uh, you think of these, uh, these stars on the balloon as the galaxies. And so let's inflate. Uh, this universe, there we go. So you see what happened, the stars didn't grow, the stars are still the same size, but the distance between the stars is growing. Actually, it's the distance between the galaxies that will grow, and it will grow and grow and grow. Uh, it could, of course, also could have a universe that went the other way. It would do something like this. 
So we have an expanding universe. And now we know this. There are many measurements that show that indeed the universe is expanding. And that's extremely exciting. Now, when Einstein made all this discovery, he became very, very famous. But there were also people who didn't like his theory. He was attacked in Germany. Almost the moment he became famous through his equation, he said, well, this is not proper German physics. You, you're Jewish. This is not good. And his life became very difficult. And he was very active. He was politically active. And at some point in 1933, when Hitler came to power in Germany, he and many other Jewish scientists had to leave. And many of them came to the United States. In fact, many of them came here to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So beginning in 1933, many children were then around would see Albert Einstein walking. So here he is. Some of you might recognize where he's walking. This is actually Olden Lane. You might have driven your car or walked. No, this is the path to the Institute. There were fewer trees. Here he is in his office. Now, uh, at this moment, the office is occupied by a mathematician called Robert Langlands. He insists on calling it Langlands office instead of Einstein's <laughs> office. If you go to the main building, you see our library. And actually, it looks exactly like this. So Einstein was here. He never traveled anymore. He stayed here in Princeton. He uh, became, of course, more famous and famous. Uh, he made many, many statements. And when he kind of finally passed away in 1955, it was seen as a great loss. Now, this was news around the world that uh, Einstein wasn't here anymore. And in fact, I love this cartoon. Uh, the planet Earth is a sign. Albert Einstein lived here. So I, I think it's a lovely cartoon. Um, but there's something else. He had these brilliant ideas. But around 1955, so that's uh, more than 60 years ago, people actually somehow didn't really take his theory seriously. Somebody wrote, it's a beautiful theory. It's like a piece of art. That's the last thing you want to hear as a physicist. You wanted to describe the world. In many ways, Albert Einstein was too smart. If you're too smart, then your ideas come too early. Nobody actually can see. You don't have the measurements. You don't have the machines to see actually what he was predicting. People didn't believe the Big Bang. In fact, they called it the Big Bang because they think it's silly. Oh, you guys with your Big Bang theory. Uh, and so, in some sense, Einstein never ever witnessed the great success of his own theory. But now it's very different. Now, in 2019, we can actually see how clever he was and see all the results. And this started actually in 1965. In 1965, there were two engineers, Penzias and Wilson. They worked at Bell Labs, very close to Holman, New Jersey. And they had a job. The job was to take this antenna that was used for telephones and eliminate a noise. So when they were listening to the antenna, they heard this. So they were told, get rid of it. Uh, now there were a lot of pigeons in the antenna. So they removed the pigeons. The pigeon droppings were removed. They had no idea what was happening. They couldn't get rid of the noise. And then somebody told, a few physicists here at Princeton University told them, you know, you will never get rid of that noise because it's actually coming from the Big Bang. Actually, you can, with this machine, you can listen to the Big Bang. So let's listen again. Here it is. This is how the Big Bang sounds. Not at the moment of the Big Bang, that's how it sounds right now. So the interpretation of this result, they were not physicists, cosmologists. They were not interested in the universe. Uh, one of the persons who made this was Jim Peebles, who actually got the Nobel Prize just two weeks ago. Right? So terrific. Uh, much, much later than the actual discovery in 1965. We're all very, very happy that he's been recognized for this. But now we can do much more. We cannot only listen to the Big Bang. We have very, very nice machines. We can basically listen in many different directions. And we can make a map of the universe when it was just born. So 
this is my baby photo. That was very cute, I, I admit. <laughs> this is the baby photo of the universe. It's not that cute, but uh, it's pretty amazing scientific result, actually. Uh, actually, this is a baby photo of the universe. You mean, what do you mean? Was the, was the universe one year old or three months old, like I was? No, the universe was very, very young, but since the universe that old, it was actually 380,000 years old, which sounds like very, very old. But the universe has been around for 13.8 billion years. So just to get an idea how long the universe has been, think about 14 buckets of sand. And every year, you can take one grain out of the bucket. The next year, you take the second. The next year, you take the third. And after a billion years, you empty the first bucket. And then there are still 13 more to go. That's how long the universe has been around. So actually, the, the first 380,000, that's not that much. You know, that's, that's just like perhaps this hand. So that's just, just a small part of the history of the universe. So, you might wonder, now, how can you see this? And what do you mean seeing the Big Bang? Now, the thing is, if you look in the universe, like look at the sun, you always are looking in the past because the light of the sun takes some time to go from the sun to your eye. So if you sit outside in a moment and you look at the sun, you actually see the sun when it was eight and a half minutes ago. If you look at the moon, it's roughly uh, one and a half seconds ago. If you look at stars, they typically are thousands of years ago. So let's zoom out again. Now here's our sun. So these are the neighboring stars. So now we're looking back thousands of years. Here is our galaxy. Now we are looking uh, 100,000 years. Now we are looking back millions of years. That's when the uh, neighboring galaxies are there. Now, and this is also beautiful animation because these are all, this is even a bigger set all of these are real galaxies, really measured by astronomers. And you see, we go further, now we are like literally billions of years looking in the past. And by the way, you see that it's, it's, it ha you have these funny butterfly wings because the astronomers are not looking all around the sky. They just, it's too much work. They look in certain directions. But if you zoom out even more, at some point you can't look further than what we call the very first light. The very first light that was emitted just after the Big Bang. And that's this, this big sphere around it. And it's that sphere that actually gives this map here. So in some sense now, if you, if you would have microwave eyes, you could look back at the very beginning of time. Now, on the same way, you can see what happened during these 14 billion years. So this is also beautiful animation. Here you see the history of the universe that took 14 billion years in 20 seconds. Here we go. So we zoom in a small part. See there, you see some matter. It actually will contract through, the, through uh, gravitational attraction. The first stars are born, the first galaxies. And in the end, our Milky Way is born, including our sun and the planet Earth. And so we can completely understand the history of the universe, starting from that very, very beginning thing in a beautiful way demonstrating uh, the, uh, the theory of Albert Einstein. Now, through that work you learn many things, but also sometimes in, in science you learn what you do not know. So one thing we have learned, and I've, somebody might ask you, what do you mean with this? Why did you bring a Christmas tree? <laughs> so if you have a Christmas tree and it's really dark, you see the lights, right? So the lights are like the stars. But if you look close up, you see there's something more. There are the leaves, there are the branches, on which, in some sense, the lights are connected. So the universe is very similar. There is a lot of stuff that we can't see. We call it dark matter. It's better, perhaps, to call it invisible matter or transparent matter. That's all there, but you can't, we can only feel it through gravity. So, for instance, around our Milky Way, around every galaxy, there's a huge cloud of dark matter. If you look at the night sky, we see all these stars and galaxies. But if you could see the dark matter, we could see the branches of the Christmas tree. And so, in animations, you can think of how the world would look like if our 
machines, our, our, our telescopes could see the dark matter. And then flying through the universe would look something like this. So all the pink stuff is invisible, but we think it's out there. You see it's kind of connecting all the galaxies. There are like big branches in the universe. And this is, was a big mystery, great discovery, that there's all this extra stuff. In fact, there's even more extra stuff. The amazing thing that also was discovered is that the universe is not only expanding, as I show with the balloon, it's going rapidly. It's expanding faster and faster. It looked like whether the, the, the space itself is like a piece of sponge. It's like it's compressed and it wants to kind of really fly out. And, uh, and it's full of energy. And this, this so-called dark energy is another great discovery. So if you want to think about the universe, uh, I've here the analog of making a drink, <laughs> then we would say that 5% of the universe we understand. So if you go to the university and you take all the physics courses, you learn about 5%. The 5% are the stars, the galaxies, everything you've seen. 95% of the universe is missing. And we think this is a great mystery. And now, I think it's some of you, the young the children here, that actually will have to solve this. But there's a lot of things to discover because 95% of the universe is still unknown. And perhaps the most exciting unknown thing is what I think you know, there are two terrific predictions of Albert Einstein. One is the Big Bang. In some sense, this is like the little brother of the Big Bang. Does anybody have any idea what I'm hinting at? something very mysterious in the universe that really captures the imagination. Yes? Black holes. black holes, yes, black holes. I'm sure many of you have been reading a black holes and wondering what they are. You know, they're this mysterious object. They're literally holes in space. I mean, in some sense I thought, you know, if you would have a black hole, I would drop it here on my trampoline. It would make a hole that goes all the way through the Earth. Uh, I was instructed not to do this, but uh, you can imagine, you know, it goes deeper and deeper and you disappear in it. That would be pretty exciting. So black holes, of course, you know, they're black holes. They're black and they're holes, you can't see them. So for instance, this is a beautiful animation. There's a black hole, he's here. You see actually the stars, and now it's eating a star. You see what happens, it eats the material of the star. That material falls in, it circles around. And it you know, sends out a lot of radiation. And that's how we astronomers can detect these black holes. They see them actually as bright spots on the sky. But actually, there's really exciting news in the last few years, which you know, I think I just wish that Albert Einstein was here to, to live through this, because it's such beautiful results from his own theory. Like we not only can well, see black holes or the radiation, we can also hear them. Because there's another great prediction of Albert Einstein, it's called gravitational waves. So again, if you think about the trampoline, you know, think about it as a drum. So I could kind of hit it, you know, and it's, it has waves. So you can kind of hit space, and then it vibrates. It makes a sound. You have to really use a lot of energy. Uh, like if I wave my hand, I'm actually producing some of these so-called gravitational waves, but nobody actually can measure these. You have to do something extremely intense. Albert Einstein, he knew there were gravitational waves, but in his time, everybody said, well, we're never ever going to detect them because the signal is just too weak. But he didn't count on how smart people are and how careful they can make measurements. This is the machine that was built to measure this. It's called LIGO detector. Uh, there actually are two of these machines, one in the south and one in the north. And they are huge pipes in which light is bouncing up and down. And you can make very, very careful measurements. If one of these ripples in space go through the machine, they can detect it. What they can detect is a signal that's 21 decimals behind the first digit. So it's the most careful machine ever, ever produced on planet Earth. I've been told that if you have a cloud floating over the machine, the gravitational pull of the cloud can be measured. So I like to say if you ever lie on your back on a summer's day, a summer's day and you see the clouds and you feel uplifted, <laughs> it's, uh, you literally are, gravity will pull you up a little bit. We have the machine that can, can measure this. 
So this is a, a terrific machine, and it made a great discovery on the September the 14th, 2015. And I think almost all of us were around at that time. Uh, and if you could listen with the machine, you heard this. And I, I, have, I have looped it, so you can repeatedly hear it. So this was a very weak signal, but it came from very far away, from billions of light years away. And the moment it was produced, it was the loudest explosion we know of in the universe. For a brief moment, the energy released by this explosion was more than the whole visible universe together. So what happened? So we now know what happened. It was a collision of two black holes. And here you see the animation. These are two black holes. You know, they're circling around. You can't see the black hole themselves. They're like black holes. But you see how the stars in the background are, are changed, just like the experiment with the eclipse that Einstein proposed. You see, they're orbiting, they're orbiting, and then finally they fall into each arms and they produce a new black hole. And this is the moment where this shock wave goes out. It traveled for more than a billion years to arrive here just in time for the machine to measure it. That's what I love. Yeah. <laughs> so now that was a big news in 2015. Actually, it was announced in 2016. Now they hear these mergers of black holes almost every day. So it's kind of, yeah, it's not so interesting anymore. <laughs> but there was something else that happened actually this year. And I'm just wondering if somebody recognizes this image. Yes, you. It's a picture of a black hole. A picture of a black hole, I thought actually we, I would never see this. But it went around the news, you know, it was on the front page of all newspapers. And just to make clear how a tremendous effort is, so I have a donut here, some of you might have eaten a donut. <laughs> so you can all see this donut, right? But suppose now I'll take the donut and move to the moon. Can you still see it? Actually, uh, you, you can if you have a gigantic telescope. In order to do this, you have to build a telescope that is the size of planet Earth. So everybody thought, okay, that's, that's a bit too expensive. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna turn the whole Earth into a big telescope. And then there were a few astronomers, why not? Let's do it. And they were very clever. They put telescopes on the North Pole, on the South Pole, well, Greenland on the South Pole, in Chile, in Spain, uh, in the US, and they connected all the telescopes, making essentially a telescope that is the size of the Earth. Now, just to imagine how much magnification you get, some of you have seen the beautiful pictures of the Hubble telescope. This one is a thousand times higher resolution. Uh, you could actually read, if you have this uh, telescope, you can read a newspaper in China. Or if you look at your finger, you would see the individual atoms. So it's a technological breakthrough. And uh, you wonder, okay, where did they look? Well, I'm coming back to the little video I showed. I think now I might even have music. This is the end of the fly through the universe. You remember this very big galaxy that we were flying through? It's the biggest galaxy in our part of the neighborhood of the universe. It's called M87. Uh, it's 55 million light years away. So light takes 55 million years. That is to say, if you look at the galaxy, you're looking at a time when the dinosaurs just had disappeared. So it's really a long time ago. Actually, here's our Milky Way at comparison. So you see we are a tiny, tiny galaxy. We thought we were living in this huge galaxy, but even that is not true, no. And uh, inside this galaxy, people believed there would be a gigantic black hole, the biggest black hole we know, and so the first thing to look at. And that's what they did. And here you see a small animation zooming in on the night sky until we see the black hole. Here we go. We go to the Virgo constellation, we zoom in, zoom in. It's a nice cloud. There's the galaxy. We go to the center, and there's the picture. 
It's pretty amazing. In fact, uh, just a little aside, three years ago I was asked by the Black Hole Center in Harvard to paint a mural of a black hole. And I told them, oh, I'm happy to do that, but if you actually see one, for free I will correct the image. <laughs> so this was my picture. <laughs> I would say it's pretty good, so uh, <laughs> they don't need, I don't need their money back, I think, yes. <laughs> um, so black holes, I think, are extremely exciting. We often feel they are like the atoms of the 21st century, because on the one hand, they're extremely simple. They're literally a hole in space. But we physicists, we also realized that, you know, in some sense, if you use the laws of quantum mechanics, that they are the most complex objects. So if you take all the information on planet Earth, you could store it in a black hole that's much smaller than the smallest particles that we know. So for us, it's always how can these crazy things exist? And the fact that we've seen a picture and we've heard the merger means actually they do exist. They look a bit like atoms 100 years ago. Now, the person most famous of studying black holes is this person here. Does somebody know his name? Stephen Hawking. So Stephen Hawking was a great scientist. He's often mentioned, you know, just as important as what Einstein did. And he passed away. He was very ill for a long time, passed away uh, last year. And uh, when he passed away, you know, he had this voice in which he talked. They took a taping of him and they broadcast that tape towards the closest black hole. So there's a voice of Stephen Hawking traveling at this moment as we speak. Uh, towards that black hole. And I just want to have you listen to a small part of that audio clip. We are all time travelers journeying together into the future. But let us work together to make that future a place we want to visit. Be brave, be determined, overcome the odds. It can be done. I love this picture. This was, by the way, when uh, Stephen was here at the Institute in uh, 1979 when we celebrated the 100th birthday of Einstein. And as you know, he passed away on March 14th, which was actually Einstein's birthday. So, uh, and he was born in 19, on January 8th, 1942, <laughs> which actually was the date on which Galileo died. So, cosmic coincidences. Now, if you want to understand black holes, you'll have to uh, do uh, a lot of research, and a lot of it is being done here at the Institute. One thing people do here is what's called string theory. I'm not going to give you a lecture about string theory. String theory is where instead of particles, you have little vibrating strings. But I would thought perhaps I invite a guest to explain what string theory is. What got you excited about dark matter in the first place? Well, I left. Everyone was talking about how cool dark matter was, and I thought, well, sure, I'll give that a whirl. So it's your rebound science. <laughs> What's that? Well, not the science you spend the rest of your life with, but the one you use to make yourself feel pretty again. <laughs> well, if I'm being honest, I never forgot about string theory. It's remarkable. It's the closest we've come to a theory of everything, something even Einstein couldn't figure out. Well, if he couldn't figure it out, maybe it's just wrong. <laughs> it's so elegant. I mean, look, string theory posits that the fundamental particles we see in three dimensions are actually strings embedded in multi-dimensional space-time. Interesting. <laughs> so that would mean that... Can't do this by myself, buddy. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you have to come to another lecture uh, when I will like, try to explain you something about string theory. But I want to end actually with what I think is the fun part of my job. You know, uh, perhaps some of you have uh, written a letter to Santa Claus at one point. I'm not sure where these letters go to, uh, I guess to the North Pole. But sometimes we get fan mail uh, uh, directed towards uh, Albert Einstein. Um, I got a, uh, the other day I got a, a wonderful letter from three girls from Italy who wondered whether Albert Einstein liked pizza. 
But I want to show you, share you uh, this, uh, this postcard to Albert Einstein. I hope you will never stop being curious. So I think that's a wonderful message. Uh, and I think actually that's also my message to you. Uh, if you saw in the very beginning, when Einstein was five years old, he already made a tremendous discovery. But the biggest discovery he made is how much is there to know? I told you only 5% of the universe we understand. The 95% you guys have to figure out. But I hope when you uh, have discovered it, you send me a postcard. Thank you very much.